Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly program in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their history, their music, their years together, their solo careers, what's going on today, what went on in the very beginning. We cover it all here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels, known for my other two Beatles programs, a syndicated show called Every Little Thing, and also another podcast show, a talk show called Talk More Talk, which is all about the solo careers of the Beatles. And I'm being joined by my two regulars. First of all, a man who's been a part of New York radio now for almost 40 years, which is hard to believe, but quite an accomplishment to itself on New York's WFUV. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Howdy, everyone. How you doing? Thank you for including me as one of the regular hosts, as opposed to one of the irregular hosts here. Well, sometimes you are a regular, but we don't go into that on the show. <laughs> that's, that's for the other. That's for another. <laughs> <laughs> and also, my other regular co-host, most of the time, uh, is the author of "The Beatles and the Cavern to the Rooftop," and also got that something. How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, changed everything. And for many years, he was a writer in the classical department for the New York Times. And he's currently working on a series of Paul McCartney books concerning his solo career. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. And hello, everyone. And we have a special guest with us here on the program this time out. It's Jerry Hammock. And Jerry has written a series of books, five in total. And they're all called the Beatles Recording Reference Manual, and they all cover certain periods of the Beatles recording careers. The last one, Volume 5, is the final one in this series, and it covers everything through 1969 and 1970. So that includes the Let It Be, Get Back, Let It Be sessions, and also Abbey Road, and then the very beginning of 1970, wrapping things up for Let It Be. And so we welcome Jerry Hammock to our show. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Ken. Thanks for having me, uh, Darren and Alan. It's great to be with you guys today. I'm looking forward to talking Beatles. Okay, so before we have our conversation with Jerry, we have a bit of news to get to. And um, last week was our first new show in three weeks. We, did, we had a lot of catching up to do. But in the past week, there has been too much news to report. But I will cover it all in just a few minutes. On uh, the last show, I announced that Lennon fans were given a, a nice treat with a new video that was made uh, for the song Look At Me, featuring previously unreleased 8 millimeter footage of John and Yoko at their home in Weybridge between takes of two of the couple's films, film number five, Smile, and Two Virgins. And just available on YouTube is the Instant Karma Evolution Mix, which has many takes of John and the band attempting uh, recording the song as it's being developed. This is all what you will find in the upcoming Plastic Ono Band box set, which is due out April the 23rd. The McCartney 3 Imagine, Imagined album comes out digitally this Friday with remixes of songs from the McCartney 3 album, the latest of which on YouTube is a video of the song Slidin. The remix for Paul is with EOB, the artist being Ed O'Brien. Fans of Mojo Magazine should delight in their next two issues, which covers the songwriting team of Lennon and McCartney. The first one, Out Now, has a headshot of John at the time of his Walls and Bridges album. The front cover reads, The Ultimate Rebel, The Finest Writers, The Full Story. So part one is on John, part two is on Paul, which will come out in May, examining the Lennon-McCartney partnership. Also, there's a brand new album coming out from Joe Walsh. It is due out April the 30th. And this is an album of prayers. Joe will be playing electric guitar on it. And he'll be collaborating with Amjad Ali Khan, who plays Sarod on the album, as well as the great bass player Nathan East. And Abe Laboreal. This is Abe Laboreal Sr., uh, who plays the bass on this album as well. Jim Keltner will join in on percussion. Ringo is not on the album, but uh, fans of Joe will delight in knowing that he has a new album coming out April the 30th. And finally, we just got news that the Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp is putting together a live streaming event 
on Zoom with both Denny Sywell and Lawrence Juber from Wings, celebrating the golden anniversary of Wings. It takes place this Saturday, April 17th, at 12 noon, that's Eastern, running for an hour, and it'll be hosted by New York's Q104's Ken Dashow, and it will involve questions and answers. And if you need more information, you can go to this website, universe.com, and then type in slash events, slash celebrating the golden anniversary of wings that's a lot to type in right there okay but that's happening this coming saturday as i said at 12 noon eastern denny sywell and lawrence juber okay that's it for the news one of the shortest newscasts i've ever done in the history of this show (laughs) (laughs) so as i said jerry hammock is our special guest on the program this time And um, the name of uh, the series of books that he has put out is called The Beatles Recording Reference Manual. I could describe this book in in full glory, but it'd be best if I let the author himself describe what this book and this series is all about. Well, thank you again for having me here, Ken. I appreciate it. The books are intended to give people an idea of how the Beatles recorded all of their catalog in the studio, basically from first take to final remix. So they include a narratives that take you through the song creation process and then they also include every day in the studio a technical breakdown of who was working on the music what the work uh, that they did in the studio what was accomplished there uh, the technical profile of whatever studio they're working with uh, emi or at uh, or trident or olympic or or any any of the other smaller studios they were working at so uh, all the gear if you're so inclined of every single every single session that they did the books also include diagrams that allow the reader to uh, follow the creation of the songs at different milestones so you can sit there with your headphones and and listen to the listen to the music and be uh, checking out the diagrams and you can actually really start to place the music in your head uh, that way and i, I know I've heard from a lot of readers that it gives them kind of a new way to appreciate and experience the Beatles music. So uh, that's been kind of a, a little fun extra. But the idea here was to kind of fill a gap in existing uh, Beatle literature to tell the story, the entire story of the songs as they were created. And uh, hopefully I've accomplished that over the over the five books. Yeah. You know, the diagrams are a real highlight for me. Because you look right at it and you can see how the whole process took place and where certain um, instruments, where they were recorded on each track and if it was um, mixed down, how that all took place. And, you know, it's really wonderful. It explains it so much easier. And um, for so many people that wanted have wanted to know all these years, how was it all done? This really explains it very well. I noticed that even though you talk about the Get Back, Let It Be sessions, really, when you start going song by song, you really start with the sessions at Apple. Yeah, the, so the Twickenham sessions were, were rehearsals, and, and they, weren't, uh, they really didn't make it into the tape catalog, even though we tend to think of, of Let It Be around the Twickenham experience because that was a great part of the film that, that they created was what was going on in Twickenham or Twickenham. Sorry. I've been corrected by that before (laughs) the recordings were done at Apple. The recordings for the album were created at Apple and not at Twickenham. So the film was, you know, based there, but the recordings and what goes, what ended up in the, in the vaults and ended up being the songs that were mixed for the album were all uh, created at Apple. Mm. All right, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, and then we'll we'll go around and, and hear from the others. But um, for one thing, I, I noticed that you listed Oh Darling as being the first song that they started working on for the Abbey Road album from the uh, Apple recording sessions on January 27th of 1969. But it was always my impression that I Want You, She's So Heavy was really the first song. Well, why I why I include the songs in the order that I include them would be their first appearance in an EMI reel in a in a reel that was in, was archived by EMI, and so 
because it shows up on a January 27th reel is why it's in the order that it's in the order that it's in. And uh, so it was tracked once during the Let It Be sessions. So that's that's why the order. But you're absolutely right. The first song that they were working on toward the Abbey Road album was I Want You, She's So Heavy. Okay. And also one thing that I found interesting, and I'm not sure if Mark Lewis covered this at all, uh, probably did, but we all know the whole story about with Oh Darling, how Paul went into the studio by himself and tried to do his vocal take, and he would normally do one take, and if he wasn't happy with it, he'd work on it another day. But the actual final vocal that was used on Oh Darling was really an edit from three different vocal takes. Yeah, it was a it was a composite uh, a composite piece. So, as he was working on it, he was they were tracking it to different open tracks of of tape, and each each day on three on three different days, he was able to get part of it the way that they liked it. So it was never one complete performance, but it was it was uh, three performances that were composited into the finished vocal take. Yeah proves how difficult it must have been to sing that song perfectly all the way through. I can't, I can't imagine. I, I mean, I just can't imagine. I can, it's, you know, knowing how difficult it was tells me why they didn't, even though they started working on it for the Let It Be sessions, tells me why it didn't make it in the Let It Be sessions. Because if the idea was that we're going to perform this live, very difficult vocally to perform that song live. And, and so best leave it alone. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine doing several different performances on the Apple rooftop of Oh Darling. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, they already needed a, a few performances of what uh, uh, of Get Back. They did a couple of, of times on there. Uh, mm-hmm. That's an. I mean, as an aside, that's a, a lot of the story of of Let It Be is to me is it's not what we may believe it to be because if we've seen the movie. You know, the fact that the Get Back single, other than the slice of life at the end of it of Thanks Mo and all of that at the very end of it that we hear, that was all recorded in Apple Studios. It wasn't recorded on the rooftop. It was a you know, studio recording of, of the song. But we're inclined to believe that it's live because we saw them do it on the rooftop. So isn't that the single? Isn't that the album cut? And absolutely not. Mm. That could be confusing. Definitely. When they put out the video for that, they also had used the studio recording with video from the rooftop. So it, it sort of, apart from having seen the performances in the film, it really kind of makes you feel like the actual performance is like, like that is a, a film performance, but it's <clears> not. It's interesting. Yeah, there's 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 more sleight of hand than you think is going on with the Beatles, uh, which has been one of the kind of the the big lessons that I've taken away from the research and work that I've done in these books is these uh, so many of these songs are not what they first appear. And it's kind of a wonderful thing to learn, you know, how how they really did come together and and the work that goes into that, the work that goes into making such a great piece of music. Mm. Okay. Um, I found it interesting concerning I Want You, She's So Heavy, uh, that Glenn Johns used two different tracks for Ringo's drums which I wasn't aware of before. One was just for the bass drum. Yeah. So Glenn, Glenn Johns is, is known for the Glenn Johns drum technique, which, uh, which does use multiple microphones. He actually started using it on, uh, on let it be. So the way that it worked on the let it be sessions was if you can visualize the left hand, left side of the kit was, was mic'd with one set of mics and the right part of the kit was, handling another part of it. It wasn't really true. It wasn't true stereo uh, because while the, the core elements of kick snare hi hat on the left side of Ringo's kit, kick snare hi hat and crash were all being picked up by one set of microphones. The other set, which would carry the, excuse me, the Tom Toms, they were always being shared with something else in the let it be sessions. It was typically Lennon's guitar that shared, shared the track with it. And then when it was mixed, these were always summed down to mono still. But uh, that was actually a revelation to me, and I came through it through the, uh, through the Glenn Johns mixes is where, you can, is where you can hear that in action. And, and so we always tend to think of the only time Ringo's 
drums occupied two tracks was during the solo for uh, for Abbey Road for the end for that track. But uh, Johns had started had started uh, recording using two tracks on the two tracks on the drums there in uh, in '69 with the Let It Be sessions, even though they were not recorded in stereo. So there's the there's the kind of the fine point of that. Interesting. What was the uh, the advantage of doing that? If just to just get some a subtle uh, different sound, or if you could describe to somebody who like who isn't a musician, what would the, be the goal in doing that? Be well, if you if you are trying to address, if you want to get some some width into your into your sound field, then having that having the drums going across a couple of tracks gives you some more options. Now the Beatles were used to, were used to collapsing these performances into one. So the drums always sounded like they were mono, but if you get a chance to listen to the Glenn Johns, uh, the bootlegs of the Glenn Johns mixes, you'll hear that there is more of a live feel because you've got that, that little bit of separation whenever whenever uh, Ringo's doing a fill that in, that includes the right side of the drum kit. You know, other than that, it feels like any other Ringo drum part, kick, snare, hi-hat, and are right, you know, are right in the same place. But the difference is, is it opens up uh, when you've got a fill coming in. Now, when the Let It Be mixes happened through Spectre, they didn't take advantage of that. He, Spectre still collapsed everything into mono, so... Okay, Alan. Okay, I think we should um, tell the listeners a bit about you know the perspective you bring to this. You actually work as a, a an engineer or producer, right? I mean, you you have professionally done this. Yeah, it's part. That's that's uh, it's part of the way I make money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now I think it's important that you know. Uh, Ryan and Key, who, uh, you know, both do too, but it, it's important to know the, the perspective you bring as someone who knows actually how this stuff works, you know, and... Uh... Yeah, the, when, I was, when I was doing this work, one of the perspectives that comes from, from doing audio engineering is that, especially on tape, there's only a handful of ways that these songs can come together, can be constructed on tape, and end up sounding the way they sound when you listen to them in stereo on your headphones or through speakers. Because you've got a limited tape count, tape count and we knew that they were working either in mono, twin track, which is two track, four track for the majority of their career, and then at the end of their career in eight track, there's just only a handful of ways that a song can be constructed to sound the way it sounds. Mm-hmm. And... You layer on top of that the limitations that came with the red consoles that they were using for the majority of their career. And now you've got even even more limited parameters of what you can do with audio that's being processed. So that helped me understand when I was trying to essentially reverse engineer in many cases how the songs came together, that it, it helped me bring that to, to life. Mark Lewison's work... Uh, in the recording sessions book and Ryan and Kihu's work, they bring some details out. They brought some new resources to bear, but they don't, they, none of them told the entire story of an entire song or if they did tell the story in some cases, it wasn't quite right. And it, in, again, in some cases it didn't line up. Like uh, for instance, you can say, let, let's say that, that you're talking about a percussion part. And in your headphones, you hear a tambourine in the left channel and a maraca in the right channel. And they say that these were recorded together to the same track. Well, if they were recorded to the same track, they would have to be in the same place. Right. Right? <laughs> and so it's those sorts of things that knowing how, so- how sound gets on tape and what you can do with it once it's there, that it did help me in understanding what was possible in the Beatles era. And then again, lining up the narrative that came from, from Lewis and the narrative that comes out when you look at the tape log, Barrett's tape log that was exposed by uh, John C. Wynn, another fantastic 
uh, Beatles author. You put those pieces together and you can start to con construct how the session had, how the sessions had to happen, the work that had to be done. And we're on top of that, then, uh, outtakes that we have session outtakes that we have that we know that here's the state of a song on on day one and here's the state of the song on day 20 and what happened in between you know now we know what happened in between how many sessions they had all of those things add up to how the song came together and that was kind of the detective work that i did to to uh to reconstruct the the creation of the songs <laughs> You didn't get any access to EMI's fault or anything, did you? Uh, no, I, yeah. I asked. <laughs> of course, and, yeah. Yeah. So and this is uh, where... So, they, were, so, they were lovely people, though. They were lovely people. Yeah. So the, yeah. the, the technical expertise is where uh, the... Com combined with your intuition is where that becomes very important when you, when you can't hear the actual masters and the, do the faders yourself. You by knowing what goes into it uh, normally, you uh, were able to sort of, as you said, reverse engineer. Yeah, and even as things were exposed, like with uh, with Howlett's notes that came with the anniversary editions of the Beatles albums, with mm -hmm. with Pepper and the White Album and that, he exposed some some new information. He also repeated some things that weren't true that were kind of contrary to what he exposed. So, but you know, even. Even with that, you know, you kind of had you, you still had to to figure out the story of what was possible with the technology to get where they got. And and again, that that's told through the through the tape library as in particular, it's told through the tape library. I can give you guys an example uh, from uh, uh, Michelle. That song, there's you know, there's there's speculation that a number of people played on it, but the tape library tells you that all the instrumentals are McCartney. And why it tells you that is because Michelle being a very simple arrangement of a couple of acoustic guitars, a lead guitar, a bass, vocals and backing vocals. If the band had participated on it, let's say, you know, Harrison had done the solo on it, you would not need a tape reduction. It could all have been handled on the four track. But Michelle involves a tape reduction. The only reason it would have been required is because the person couldn't play two things at the same time. Right. And so again, the tape starts to tell you stories, and uh, and that's that's for me that's what I would follow was was what's the tape telling me, and then what are my ears telling me that is that is possible, and. I mean, all of this was lining up a bunch of moving pieces all at the same time to get as close as I could to like, what happened? Mm -hmm. How did you decide to, can you go back to the very, the genesis of this project and, and talk about how you decided to do it in the first place, whether you thought <laughs> um, that, you know, even if EMI were to say no, when you asked, you know, how you would get around that and, uh, and, when did you know that like this is something that could be done and would be useful? Um, because there are, you know, some other books that take it, you know, a couple of steps and the, the next one's a couple more steps. And then yours actually goes um, several steps beyond those. So uh, you, you had to have known at some point that this was going to be worth doing and that you could do that. So what was that? Yeah. So the, the genesis of the project was I had some time on my hands. And I would, as I was, as I would work as a as a producer, you always get questions about the Beatles. You'd always get references to the Beatles. Hey, we're doing a guitar solo tomorrow. I love that sound on "While My Guitar Gently Weeps." Can you get me that? Oh, I love that pepper. The classic is oh, I love that pepper bass sound. Can you get me that Sergeant Pepper bass sound? And so you'd go and it, as a producer, you always say, "Oh yeah, of course, whatever you want." <laughs> I'll get you. I'll get you that, and then you go research it and figure it out as close as you can, and try to dial it in and give give people what they want. I got to a point where I had a little bit of time, and I thought I'll look into some more of these things and see how they, you know, how they did that, how they recorded. And just about this time, the Ryan and Keo book came out, 
for re- recording the Beatles, which is a, the if people aren't familiar, it's a very deep dive into the technical aspects of of the recording studios they worked in. So it dissects all of the gear that they worked that they worked with, and tells some stories about how the songs are put together. So I started down that road, and then it just came to me of you know I'd kind of like to know not just how some of these sounds were put together, like that guitar sound or that bass sound. But wouldn't it be cool if you could, at first I thought it'd be a website. Wouldn't it be cool if you could say, what microphone on guitar for this song? You know, wouldn't that be a, wouldn't that be cool for musicians to be able to, to know that or what amplifier or, you know, name it. And then I realized I couldn't monetize that and it would be a very complicated database. <laughs> so, and so I started just doing the research to, to bring it together and, after a couple of months, I recognized that there wasn't, there were no books like this out there. That if I did this, I would be helping the Beatles community because there was a gap in the information. There were pieces of these songs. There were there were pieces of how it was recorded, uh, pieces of what the studios were like, but none of it was tied back to how were the songs created in the studio. And so I thought. I'll try to tell that tale. And there happened to be, again, enough pieces of, of research that were there. And then I teamed that with, you know, researching all the Beatles, all the photographs that you get of the Beatles of the studio to cross-reference, like, what gear are they using? Where, what microphones are they using? All of that sort of thing. Yeah, and, I, and there was enough information uh, between tape logs, existing literature, and and all the different kind of uh, documentary assets again, like photographs, takes and outtakes, fine, you know, mixes, remixes of Beatles songs that exposed enough information to be able to tell this story. Mm-hmm. Structurally, these are pretty complicated books, uh, you know, as opposed to books that start with the first sentence and end up at the last sentence in its narrative. <laughs> you have like lots of different sections, and if you want, specific kinds of information you know it, it's 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 helpful to become familiar with the layout of these books first I, I i've actually been thinking of putting tabs in the different sections the way <laughs> like when you, your high school notebook you know yeah, yeah, um, yeah but when did it dawn on you that that would be um actually i mean the way i've described it it sounds like it's 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 complicated and hard to use but it's not um it's it's actually very useful. And and when did you decide that that would be the approach you would take as opposed to just going chronologically from A to B? Well, I knew from my, I, I, I just had a gut feeling for myself that there are certain Beatles songs, that there are certain eras of the Beatles music, which is why there's five volumes. They're kind of broken into eras. Um, but there are certain songs that the Beatles did or certain like landmark days that they worked that I was really interested in. And if I told this as a narrative A to Z story, let's say I told the story of 1969, and let's say with uh, the Let It Be sessions, I talk about Harrison's Telecaster, his Rosewood Telecaster. And now we get down the road, you know, a few months, now we get down the road and we're working on Abbey Road. And if you want to learn about the Telecaster, you had to go back to the let it be, you know, to learn, to remember what was there. I didn't think that was very useful. So looking at this as truly as a reference manual, I thought I want to give people, however they want to, they want to get into this information, a number of different paths to enjoy it. So path one is the narratives where I take you from first take to final remix. Path two is session by session by session. That's kind of the the daily narrative. And and in those, you'll learn about all the people, all the work, all the gear that was that happened in that particular session in that particular studio. Those seem to me to be the essential ways to get through the information. The final was just an appendix of of gear and use at certain eras in, in it. But I I wanted you to be able just to look at one song and know the whole story of it. So one of the criticisms of the book is that there is that it's or the books are that they are repetitive when you talk about a song by song basis. Like in the early years, of course, they were using a lot of the same gear. The sessions were very close together. 
so the narrative of a of a song in in 64 from song to song is pretty similar but again i didn't want you to have to know about the gear that was being used on a hard day's night in order to appreciate the work that was done on if i fell okay i wanted you to be able to appreciate that song in its entirety and you could look at it, you know, you could you could read just the story of that song if you wanted to, uh, if that was the only one that interested you. So that was that was the idea behind how I did the layout of the layout of the of the organization was again reference manual and give people multiple paths through it and not require them to jump around in the book to understand what was going on on any one particular song. Okay. I'll pass you on to Darren. All right. So how would your research have changed? Obviously, probably would have been much easier. But had EMI said yes to you, you oh. can have access to the to the tapes. First of all, first back up a little. At what point did you approach EMI in the process of writing? Was it at the very beginning before you really started to get your hands dirty with the with the project? No, it was after I, my hands had got fairly dirty. The, one, the the first person I, or the first approach that I made was to Mark Lewison and, you know, let him know what I was, what I was doing. You know, his information is foundational and really you can't, you know, you can't do this work without what he gleaned from the paper trail that was in the archives at EMI. And I couldn't do this book if he hadn't given me permission to, utilize that information so he was the first approach i made and and i was ready for him to say forget it you know but he was lovely and so that was the first approach i made so it was sort of with his blessing on the project that i approached emi about an abbey Abbey road studios and emi and apple about getting some access how would my approach have changed i would have Equal to the tapes, I would have gone after the recording sheets. I would, if I could, have, the, the recording sheets for me are, that's the holy grail. Because for people who aren't aware, before any session that was, was done at EMI, the balance engineer, who's the lead engineer on the project, had to fill out a sheet requesting from the, what were called the recording engineers in that, in that era, but there were the backroom guys, the brown coats or the amp room boys. They had to, they were the people that set up the microphones. They were the people that did the signal routing of the gear. They were the people that, that brought in the Altec compressors and the Fairchild limiters. They were the ones that, uh, that plugged in the EMT plate reverbs and routed to the echo chamber one, two or three. So there is a wealth of information on on these session sheets that give you the state of the recording for that day, at least to start. So you'll know what's in play, even down to where things were set up in the studio. Where's the grand piano set? Where's the drum set set up? Uh, how many microphones are on this particular uh, instrument. So for me, you know, that's where I would have started. I would have, I would have been going for the file cabinets before I went for the tape library. <laughs> and and these uh, these uh, sheets was it were they ma- well maintained in one location, or were you hunting down a variety of people and looking in, you know, uh, basements? Well, I did. Yeah, I did. I did not get access to them. And this, you know, they are they're still at EMI. And I did not get I did not get access to them. Didn't well, get access to them no, I didn't. Either. No, and, and right. so what I what I was was trying to communicate was that that for me would have been the biggest change in my process. Would and it would have it would have shortcut a lot of work for me to to understand the technical configuration of the session before it started. Now the second thing is if you can get a hold of the tapes before even listening to them is seeing whatever notes exist on the tape boxes or any, or any inserts, you know, commonly there can be a sheet of notes that come along with any multi-track tape of saying what's on this, what's on this track and what's on that track. And that can give you an idea of the construction as well. So the paper trail, excuse me, is, is as important as the audio trail in telling you, in telling you what happened. I'm, you know, I'm hoping the day will come. It probably won't be in my lifetime that the the tapes are made available for research that we're a, that we we're 
we're able to, you know, hear these multi-tracks that they're, you know, that they're digitized and we can hear, really hear all of the work that went into, into these great songs. But, uh, you know, maybe not in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. You talked about the fact that uh, the Beatles were known for working at EMI Studios to become Abbey Road, known as Abbey Road Studios, but there were other studios they worked in as well. But I've always found Apple Studios fascinating. Um, what little I know about it from what from reading, uh, you know, an article here or a book or a chapter here, we've heard about Ma Magic Alex, uh, <laughs> and we've heard about the band looking to move into their studio and begin work, which they couldn't do initially because some changes had to be made. Do you include any of, uh, say, the layout or or the history of Apple Studios? How long? Was the was the construction of the studio going on before mid January '69 when it was going to be used for the first time by the band? I don't talk about those sorts of aspects, the historic aspects of any of the studios. Uh, I I do talk about the configuration of the studio as far as the gear and things like that that were going on with it. Uh, as they came to use it for the work that they used it for. So I limit. Those are kind of the boundaries of my scope. Like I'm not. I'm not a traditional historian. I don't try to tell the Beatles story through these books. I try to tell the story of the creation of the recordings. You know, there are way better historians than I will ever be that are writing on this stuff and, and doing, you know, brilliant work. And, you know, I would be just regurgitating that stuff. So, you know, again, I'm, I'm trying to fill a void is what I was always trying to do with these books of, of, this aspect of their story hasn't been told. I'll tell that bit of it and give, you know, give my piece of the puzzle to, to fit in. And it was that, how were the songs made in, in the studio? Uh, so I do address some of the fact that, or address the fact that when they came to Apple studios, it was a, it was a train wreck that uh, Alex had promised them a, I want to say it was a 72 track uh, mixing console he thought that they should have a speaker for every track of audio and none of this stuff worked. They did one pass, I believe of audio through what Alex had constructed and it was just, you know, fizzle and, and noise and no signal was getting to tape. And that was that. So, you know, EMI to the rescue bringing, you know, allowing them to, to uh, use, two different red consoles, a 51 and a 37. And uh, I'm not sure if it was an EMI loan on the 3MM23-8 track or if that was, George had a 3M, so I'm not sure if it was George's machine or if it was a, a loan on a, on a machine from EMI. But, you know, again, Alltech compressors came in, Fairchild limiters came in. Those are all from the through the good graces of of emi that they were able to do any work at all at apple studios mm. hmm. interesting and and match gals had the invisible uh sound uh oh yeah yeah <laughs> invisible force fields that would that would yeah yeah we don't we don't need uh there's a term there's a term for sound baffles in the studio called gobos go-betweens that you put up to isolate different instruments from each other, different performances from each other. You see them in the let it be film. Ringo's behind some gobos when you see him drumming. All you see is the top of his body. Yeah. Magic Alex didn't said that he didn't need any of those, that he would create a sonic force field that would isolate each performer from the other. And it would not be required. He didn't have any, uh, uh, any wiring between the control room and the studio. He hadn't created he hadn't created patch points in the studio. So they had to run cables through an open door from the studio back to the control room in order just to get a signal to the console. So, you know, the guy was not an audio engineer. He certainly wasn't a designer. Uh, ultimately, uh, Apple hired Jeff Emmerich to come in and help them get this all sorted out and, and bring a true professional studio to life. So would you say it's unreasonable to say that Alex was a charlatan? <laughs> No, I, I would I would say that's the most reasonable statement that you could make about the guy as far as, uh, yeah, yeah, he uh, he must have been a very convincing personality Charismatic. because I can't think of, yeah, I can't think of, I can't think of anything that he created that was either original 
or if it wasn't original or if it was it wasn't it wasn't something he borrowed from someone else that worked like he didn't make things that worked <laughs> so at least you know again that's that's the that's his story in relation to the beatles his, you know beyond his story you know again uh you're probably talking to the wrong guy it's a wonder the beatles actually were able to work in in that space after they left twickingham it, it, it truly it truly is and again through the good graces of uh of emi they were able to do that uh it would not have been possible without emi's cooperation they would have been you know we probably would have seen the album you know created in a combination of emi trident and olympic it would, mm-hmm. would be the most likely uh, uh outcome of that maybe regent regent sound studios would probably have played a role in that as well you know all of the all of the haunts that they had that they had previously worked at, but Apple was in no shape to record music uh, mm-hmm. at all. So, are there any examples you could give us um, that you know in trying to piece together the recording of a particular song that you found it very challenging to actually sort through what was what had been done to achieve the finished product? Uh, were there any? Any songs that uh, were really puzzling you uh, and causing you, like, I can't figure out what these guys were doing, uh, that you eventually did obviously soar through, but uh, were there any songs that you could just cite that were like, were like a very hard puzzle to put together? Yeah, actually, uh, probably the most difficult one was While My Guitar Gently Weeps. And... I, I think I made uh, I made assumptions that would that are probably fairly common when you hear a song that sounds rich and complicated, is you think this was a complicated recording, and I went back and forth with uh, with Ken Scott about in particular how the organ and the and Clapton's guitar were recorded for this for the track, and. You know, the, the guitar's got ADT on it, ADT uh, artificial uh, double tracking, and the sort of flange-like slurring that you hear of that on, on the song. These are, were processes that could only be done on mix down. They could not be done when you were recording a track live. So that gives you the idea that, and, and the narrative that I that I could, could get my hands on for the, the song told me that, the guitar work was done as an overdub and you know, that all makes plenty, you know, makes plenty of sense that, you know, the solo work is done after the core backing track is done. And so I went back and forth with Ken Scott about, well, how is this achieved with the song? You know, this was the first song that was tracked on eight track. The eight track had not yet been configured for ADT. And so how does this get done? And we went back and forth about a, you know, a handful of scenarios and he didn't, didn't recall specifically, but we kind of got it ironed out of, of a couple of ways that that could get done. This is the, you know, path a was the most likely path. And I thought, Oh, okay, I've got it sorted out. Clapton did an overdub and they were, they tracked it to the eight track. And by the time they were mixing it, they were able to route it out for ADT and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then we get the Abbey Road anniversary edition comes out, you know, mercifully for me comes out before my book comes out. <laughs> and, and there is the audio that shows that Clapton's tracking his solo with the backing track with the band the easiest way you could possibly do it, <laughs> right? You know, the easiest way. Let's just play the song, and when we get a good take, we've got a good song. Oh. And, I, I mean, that came up so many times with the, with the Beatles, and especially as you move to the eight tracks, which were the hardest things to decipher overall. Um, because with eight track, you have the potential for what are called internal tape reduction remixes or bounce down mixes. The four track when they would run out or, or even twin track, when you'd run out of tape, meaning I've used all the tracks, I had to send that signal to another tape. And so it shows up in the tape library, right? That other tape shows up. And now I know that they've done a bounce down and it sent what was done in the previous tape to the next tape. Now I can follow the narrative. I know what's going on. 
with internal bounce downs, what happens is we've got eight tracks of tape and let's say I've filled up six of them and I know I've got, I need four more tracks to get what I've planned for the song done. So with those two open tracks now, I'm going to send some of that six I've already recorded to those two open ones. And that opens up, let's say I could open up four tracks now. Well, that doesn't show up in a tape log. And the Beatles or the engineers didn't record when they did an internal bounce down. They didn't make a note of that like they would when they were doing a tape reduction from tape to tape. So, you know, it really was only through some of the information that was exposed in, in these anniversary editions that, you know, th some of this came to light in order to decipher what happened with, in particular, Abbey Road was, was very complicated. But it goes back to the White Album as they started using the eight track about midway through the, the White Album. Again, what informs me and what I had to remind myself as you know, being an audio engineer and being a producer is you never do this work in the most complicated way possible. You always do this work in the easiest way possible. You're always on the clock. You know, you're always just trying to get it done. And so Norm Smith, Jeff Emmerich, Ken Scott, you know, George Martin, none of these guys were thinking, Oh, okay. What's the most complicated way to record a guitar solo? <laughs> Let's do that today. <laughs> you, you know, they were never thinking that. They were thinking, "Let's get this guitar solo done so we can get the next thing done." Because we got, we got, you know, we're doing. Think of the pace of the Beatles of the Beatles production in the early years. It was two albums a year and two singles a year, which was four additional sides. So they're doing twenty-eight. They're doing like thirty-two songs in a year that they're recording in addition to television, movies, radio, right? You know, press, all that sort of stuff. You don't have time to mess around. You do not do this the most complicated way you can. You are the most, you know, air quotes, creative way you can. You try to get a solution that works. And if it works, great, we're done. And sometimes the solution was everyone just played the song. And the Beatles, what was wonderful about the Beatles and what's revealed as, as I did this work was how much of it they played together, how much of it was done as a band, you know, complete backing tracks, you know, all together, all four guys working on a song together to get the foundation or three of the four guys. If, you know, someone was out of town working together to to get the foundation of a track done uh, down and uh, so much of the work was done that way. And that sets the spirit and sets the tone for everything that follows. You know, I think that's why the the work lasts for us and and resonates still. Is this is a you know a group of of musicians that is communicating with each other, and we get to listen in on that communication between musicians. Uh, one more question that I want to ask now, because you're talking about them bouncing tracks down uh, to make room for. Uh other tracks and other things to be recorded on tape. This question comes from a, a complete, absolute novice wannabe recording engineer that I've always found this fascinating. How did the Beatles and, and every recording act avoid losing sound quality by bouncing, uh, you know, t taking a four track, getting all that transferred to another tape down to one track? And I would hear about not just the Beatles, but other bands who uh, artists who would record and who would do a lot of that. And I'm wondering, how did they avoid second generation, third generation, losing quality of uh, of the recording by bouncing all these tracks all over the place? How would it's that a, avoid, if not? It's a, it's a great question. There's there's a couple of keys to it. One is having, you know, world-class engineering staff. And they certainly did, you know, with uh, Ken Townsend, just you know an absolute genius and then the people that were trained uh, up you know through uh, you know Norman Smith this balance engineer Emmerich Scott you know these guys are are world you know world class so that's component number 1 component number 2 is really good gear and they had that as well uh, EMI was was in particular was known for taking gear apart and putting it back together so it met their standard. So 
for people that go this deep into the in, into the the Beatles in the studio, you'll see gear that's like the a compressor they use, which is the EMI RS124 compressor. It's all over their recordings. Uh, McCartney played his bass through it. Uh, in particular, drums got recorded through it. This was an Alltech. I believe the it was an Alltech 453 compressor that came into the studio, and the EMI engineers, in conjunction with Hayes, which was their their research uh, and and manufacturing uh, wing, they took this Alltech compressor apart and they rebuilt it to meet their spec and to be able to have control over aspects of the compression sound chain that they wanted control over. So when they were done with it. It was an entirely different piece of gear. And so it got an EMI number, in this case, uh, RS-124. When they were doing this, it had to meet certain parameters for how quiet the piece of gear was, how durable it was, because it was being used. This The studio was, was open you know, six or maybe even seven days a week for three sets of sessions that basically went from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., Every day, so the gear that they're using had to be able to to handle that amount of work and be dependable, you know, be dependable, so durable and also sound great. So that's that's the other component of it: great engineering and then really good gear. Now, the fact when you're working with, uh, in particular with the with the four track, they were using one inch tape stock for four track. That meant that every Every track of audio had a quarter inch of tape or of of tape to saturate. Uh, so for people who are familiar with home reel to reel machines, that's a quarter inch tape typically is is a home reel to reel machine. Cassettes, I think, are one eighth if you still got a cassette around. But now think of four of those. Now that's a lot of area to saturate. And again, because of that, you can get a really high quality signal. A lot of saturation means there isn't a lot of noise. So your generational loss is actually fairly insignificant. Team that with the fantastic Studer uh, J37 they were using or the Telefunken M10 machines, which are great four-track machines. And, you know, again, quiet machines, lots of tape saturation, great engineering. You don't lose a lot. And they were generationally, they would go out sometimes three generations from the original, from the original recording before they were done with their reductions. Now, this wasn't always the case with their audio, and if you listen to some of the stuff on Magical Mystery Tour that was not recorded at uh, at EMI, there some of those recordings are a little bit noisy. Your mother should know. Not the greatest sounding Beatles track. So when you got outside the EMI process and the EMI gear and that level of expertise, and you got into more of these you know boutique studios, Regent, Olympic, Trident, uh, not the same results. So they were able to do it EMI because they had the guys and they had the gear. Fascinating. I, I mean, because I, I, I just recently read a little bit about the recording of you know, getting onto another band for a second, Pink Floyd's The Dark Side of the Moon. And I was, I mean, that's that's like the standard. Uh, yeah. But, but yet they were, you know, it was a transfer of this track and this yeah. under, you know, dubbing. And I'm like, well, how, wait a minute, hold on a minute. How did they do that and maintain the finished product that they ended up with. Yeah, there's a you know there was such a standard of, of work at, at EMI and where Dark Side of the Moon was recorded there as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, for pe- for people who aren't aware, yeah, such a, there's such a standard of work going on there, and and also there because they were doing this work all the time. I tend to think of EMI in this era as a bit of a of a hit factory in in the manufacturing sense where when you get a process down that works well, you repeat it. You don't try to reinvent it. You use it, and you use it on everybody. An example that that I give of, of lessons learned and then repeated in the Beatles era uh, relates to the Hollies. So everyone knows, everyone who's a Beatles fan knows that there was a period where they, you know, they were desperately trying to get more bass tone on their records. McCartney wasn't happy with the sound of the bass because the Motown bass sound sounded better. And I think they 
or the stuff that was coming out of Capitol in the U.S. was sounding better, those those U.S. recordings. And I think they actually sent Emmerich over to to the U.S. to like kind of figure out, like, what were they doing over there? What's the secret sauce in getting more bass signal? Well, one way or another, they figured it out. And we're getting a better, you know, overall bass tone. Part of it was recording the bass independently and, you know, and, or giving it its own track so you could process it a little bit differently. But they figured it out. And all of a sudden, we're getting like some really good bass tones. Well, now listen to the Hollies records during this same era. Listen to uh, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. And what you'll hear is McCartney's bass tone on a Hollies record. And it's because they learned the lesson of what a good bass tone is. And you know that the Hollies walked into the studio after they heard it on the, heard what the Beatles were doing and said, I want that. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want a crappy bass tone anymore. Can you give me what you gave McCartney? And yes, they could. And so they did. And, and that was going on across the board at, at EMI lesson learned and now applied to every artist that they worked with. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Thank you. All right, Ken, back to you. Okay. This is all amazing stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Can you um, clarify? Did you say that While My Guitar Gently Weeps was the first A-track recording? Because we had done an interview not that long ago, and I could have sworn we were talking about Hey Jude as being the first. And then you have to clarify, there are some songs that started as a four-track that moved to A-track, and then there's the pure (laughs) A-track. That's correct. And and, uh, so, absolutely, the very first eight-track that they did was Hey Jude at Trident. Now... But the very first eight track that they did at EMI was While My Guitar Gently Weeps. Uh, a handful of those songs on the White Album made the move from four track, started on four track, and were transferred to eight track. So that's that's true as well. Some people think of the White Album as an eight track album, and or, you know, record on eight track. And it's more than half the songs on the White Album are actually four track recordings still doing things the way that they had done it forever. So there's a, there was another kind of, you know, bubble burst. Uh, I think less than, less than half of the songs are eight track. And if you count the ones that started on four track, as well as the four track, it's the majority of the white album. Yeah. I've always kind of felt that as much as I love the song back in the USSR has a very high end sound to it like an am sound yeah to it and and that's a four track and then i was wondering why it didn't have a fuller sound like like the rest of the album that's just my ears i don't know if you feel the same way but i'm well, I, I, what i what i was stumbling on there is is uh trying to recall if that was a four track or an eight i believe back in the ussr that's, is an eight that's a eight four track. track it is a four track i'm pretty yeah. sure uh, I'd have to uh, to dig out my notes. You got a, you have a book in front of you. Yes, I do. I <laughs> have volume four now. What did that idiot write? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just find it here. Uh, let's see. Back in the USSR is a four track. Okay. So there there definitely was uh, an era there when the Beatles were getting their hands on the mixes a little bit more, and the White Album. The White Album is one we know that they participated in the uh, in the mix to a high degree. the The album itself was was mixed for both mono and stereo in the same session, basically a twenty four hour marathon that they did at, at EMI. Emmerich always commented that when McCartney in particular was was there, it was always wanting just more of everything. So more trouble, more bass, you know, more, more, more. And now for us as, as listeners, our ears are much more attuned to mid-range and high frequencies than they are to low frequencies. And so it makes plenty of sense that if you're in there and you're asking for more, that the dominant frequencies are going to be the higher frequencies, which kind of basically takes the bottom end out of the mix. And, and, and will dominate, even, even if it doesn't dominate, if you're looking at it like on a spectroscope or something, it's going to dominate for our hearing, the way that humans hear things. Um, so there's a lot of upper mid-range in 
the mixes of the white album in particular, not quite as balanced. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think that has to do with the fact that the Beatles, you know, were, were having their say, they wanted more of everything. And it was done in a very compressed amount of time. It was done, you know, essentially the mixes were finished in a, in a day, even if they were at a certain state and they, they knew they, everything was coming together in that one 24 hour session across the whole studio, by the way, kind of took up every room to get that album, that, that big album out. All right. Now this is the kind of minutia that I'm into. <laughs> and I know some Beatle fans are too, but um, for the song, something early on in uh, the early takes, you actually had John playing a Steinway piano and also a descending piano line, which ended up getting erased and in the final mix, there's an organ. That's Billy Preston. So I just want to make sure John is nowhere on the song something. In the end, John is not represented on the mix. John's definitely represented on this on the state that we will hear in different outtakes of something. Right. That that work is there, but the work didn't didn't last through the uh, through the overdubbing process. Yeah. It's a shame. I mean, John, in the final mix, he's not on the two George Harrison songs on Abbey Road. Also, uh, since you were just talking about uh, Michelle and that they had to do overdubbing there, it reminded me of when we were talking about She Said, She Said. And maybe you can give us uh, more of a final answer on the controversy as to whether or not Paul does play bass on it because the story is that there was a a feud of some kind in the studio and Paul ran out and then George went and played the bass. I guess they, yeah, (laughs) (laughs) I know this is what you said in my interview. I want to bring it out in this show. Yeah. So um, you can clear this up. Yeah. So the tale of the tape is the backing track of she said, she said the backing track did include the entire band. It included bass and drums, on uh, one channel and guitars on two guitars on another channel. So, you know, unless George could have played, you know, uh, actually, so for George to have played bass on, she said, she said would have required Ringo to re-record his drum part. Right. So the, um, no doubt they had a fall. They had a bit of a, of a dust up, but it happened after they got the backing track done. Okay, good. We'll put that to rest. I know yeah. there's there's still people online that debate this, so uh, yeah. well and 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 they will not take my word. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the you know again that is the tale that that's the tale of the tape with it is the backing track was backing track was was put together uh, with the entire band and the bass occup the bass and the drums uh, occupy the same uh, space. Okay. So. And as for Old Brown Shoe, since there's a lot of controversies around that particular song, you do concur that Paul is playing the drums on there because there's a lot of people who think, oh, it sounds too much like Ringo. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, uh, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. <laughs> you know that Kevin Howlett had it in the book that Paul played drums, and when people found out about it, it's like, it's the first time we heard this, and it sounds too much like Ringo, and so... Yeah, you know, there's, there's, you know, again, there's, there's some things where, you know, the, the fan community that that does love to discuss this stuff, you have to believe something when you're hearing it from the horse's mouth, and so let's all, you know, take a breath and remember that what Hallett wrote was read and approved by Ringo and by Paul. So if Ringo played drums on it, he's not going to let Paul take credit for it. He's mm. going to take credit for it. You know, you know, so, you know, these things aren't happening in a vacuum. The approval, you know, the, the, the approval process at Apple is a very small crew. It's Sean now, you know, Yoko, Sean, it's Olivia, it's Paul, you know, that's, you know, Olivia and Danny and it's Paul. And if, you know, they're the gatekeepers and, you know, again, you know, Ringo had a hard enough time getting credit (laughs) as it was. So yeah, I I always fall back to I, I I really do try to come back on on what's the most logical explanation for for many of these things, and it doesn't need to be needlessly complicated. There doesn't need to be a conspiracy. There doesn't need to be any of that. If 
you know, Hallett is Hallett was hired by the Beatles to tell that story. And, you know, that's something getting credit for some work is a, an important part of the story. So again, if Ringo played drums on it, Ringo wants you to know that he played drums on it. Sure. If he remembers. And yeah. sometimes, <laughs> sometimes no, they that's don't. That's a good point. You know, no, that, no, that's very, that's very true. The, that, that's very true. Yeah. But that's, you know, that's where I come down. And, and, you know, Alan, you, 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 you point out, I mean, that's where the doubt comes in and that's where, you know, people will continue to debate it, but I'm, I'm, I'm of the point of view that, that that's a, another solved mystery. Okay. Well, I, I certainly want to believe their story the way that they, that they, the Beatles tell it and who would know better you would think, but they are human. And I'm reminded of a time when uh, I saw Paul George, and Ringo and George Martin are on the recording console and they're playing Golden Slumbers. Yeah. And uh, George is saying, oh, who's playing the bass there? George Harrison is saying that. Yeah. You know, and it was George Harrison who played the bass. Yeah. So he didn't yeah, yeah. remember. So it's possible. No, it's very much it's very much possible. Now, you know, when Martin does what he in that particular segment that you're talking about, when when Martin shows or lets them know that this is the you know this is the construction of the or this is the construction of that backing track that McCartney was on piano. Well, mm. then it makes it obvious what happens. And uh, yeah, but we can't you know we we can't fully count on memory. And again, this is why it's so nice in the Beatles case that there are so many resources that again, if if you go through them carefully enough and you try to reconcile them, and everything has to. Everything has to line up pretty well, and and I want to uh, I want to let people know if I don't know some I, I hope you guys who who own the book can uh, validate this. If I don't know what happened, I don't pretend like I know a story that I don't know. If it's unknown, it's unknown. If this is the best information we have, it's the best information we have. But it's not definitive. It's not definitive. And I don't. I really made a point of not pretending to know things about who played what. Or you know that sort of thing. If I didn't know, I will say an unknown beetle played tambourine. If I don't know who played tambourine, right. but in, in a lot of cases, you can deduce these things based on what was going on in the studio, who was there, and the recording process. Knowing that the way that they assembled the songs, you can fill in some of these blanks. But where you definitely can't fill in the blanks, and I don't have any good information that's you know that that clarifies it then i'm not pretending to know stuff i don't know and if i've got something wrong i also always put out there contact me through the website if you see something that i you believe i've like boneheaded and if you can give me chapter and verse that tells me something different i'm going to dig into it and if it changes the book then you know god bless you let's get let's get things right i want these to be as right as they can be as much as any beatles fan does Hmm. Okay. Alan, you got a few more questions? Yeah, I have a couple more. One was, uh, you know, when the first CDs came out and they came out in mono and uh, there was the whole thing about whether they were originally mono stereo. And I talked to George Martin and we got into the later albums in the discussion and he basically had said, you know, some of these recordings were so complicated that it would be impossible for me to reconstruct them and have them sound the way they did because so many things were, so many weird processes were going on. Subsequently, his son did just that. And reading your, in particular this morning, I was reading about uh, in the book about Golden Slumbers, and uh, not Golden Slumbers, The End. And I'm thinking, you know, how on earth could he possibly have gone back to the multi-tracks and reconstructed that, you know, without there being some kind of a roadmap? But I don't think George Martin left roadmaps to all those mixes and edits and, you know, taking things out because the orchestra is not quite in sync and, you know, then redoing. Your book actually really kind of made me appreciate Giles Martin's work even more because um, it looks to me like uh, just reading your description, I don't know how I would reconstruct something like that and make it sound anything like the LP did. 
keeping in mind his mixes sound different a little, but but <laughs> yeah. not yeah. you know. Well, as, as you get to the later, you know, later work and and uh, you know, Ab- as far as the the remix versions, these anniversary remix versions go, as you get later down the line uh, with when they're fully into eight track here with Abbey Road so much of it is baked in there's very little actually that giles could do to you know to fully make things his own now emi or emi i always say that abbey road now uh, they do have a um, a series of technologies that they call demixing that they use and so they're able to take any sort of what you might call baked in recording let's say it's a master that you don't have the original multi-tracks for or you can take a multi-track that you've got a combination of of uh, performances on let's say i've got a a, both a bass and a guitar on the same track and through their this techno this demixing technology they are able to extract the individual parts and then create a new digital file of each of these individual parts so that was available to Giles in order to, you know, to be able to do some of the reconstruction work that he did and, and the remixes that he did and make these their own or make these his own. But so much of it in the eight track is, is just baked in. You know, you can't back out when, so earlier we were talking about the, a bounce down, an internal tape reduction remix on an, on an eight track. Uh, what I didn't finish with that is if back in the scenario where I filled up six tracks and I know I'm going to need four more. So I take, let's say four of those six and I move them to an additional, to a new track. Let's say I just move them to one track. The intention of moving them is to record over the original work. Right. So once I've moved them and I've added new work on the tape that they used to occupy, they're gone. So this isn't like the days of, of Pepper where you would do a tape-to-tape tape remix and I could go back to an earlier reel of tape if I'm Giles Martin and grab that performance from that earlier reel to make my reconstruction of it. These performances are gone. They've been, the original performances have been wiped out and you're left with what was done in, in the tape production. So you know, again, as you get later on in their career with, uh, in particular with Abbey Road, it doesn't surprise me that his work sounds very close to the original because there's very little he could honestly do to make it his own. He didn't have the granularity of control that was baked into being able to extract the the source audio from multiple original takes. Mm-hmm. I think my last question is um, historical, um, even though you uh, aren't a historian, um, working with the materials, you might have an opinion. Um, I think Mark Lewison has um, held the view recently that the le- that 1969, basically the subject of this book, was almost like one big project that they didn't necessarily distinguish between the end of Let It Be and the start of what became Abbey Road. They just continued recording, as you as you pointed out, they had a version of Oh Darling, and then in February they recorded I Want You, She's So Heavy. Um, through the spring, they, uh, you know, they put the Get Back single out, and at the same time, or around the same time, did Ballad of John and Yoko. And, and, uh, and then, you know, in the summer, suddenly it was, the Abbey Road sessions. Um, he sees it as like one big project in a way. Like we haven't put out an album in 1969. In January we did this stuff. In February we did this, and that our view of it as two separate projects is incorrect. I'm not sure I buy that totally. I, you know, I think that I think that they did let it be with this TV show idea, and that. At the end of January, when Ringo had to go off and film Magic Christian, that was basically the end of that part of the project. But he's taking a different view, and I was just wondering um, how you felt about it. I tend to agree with with you now uh, that uh, the Let It Be project was fairly well defined. Start as a as a, a TV, you know, made for TV sort of of movie that they were working on, 
and and then they get to the end of January and it's in and they're it's in the can. They're ready to, you know, they're ready to say good say goodbye to it. What happens is, of course, with all of the all of the film to get sorted through and edited, all of the uh, particularly the film, the audio is pretty compact, but with the film and then with audio they weren't proud of, it didn't get done. And so now you're in uh, in February, February, March, April, and they realize that they don't have a product for 1969. You know, this film is not getting done. Mm-hmm. And what do we do? And so now they pick up and they start recording the Abbey Road album in in earnest from a song perspective they were working on maxwell silver hammer i want you something octopus's garden you never give me your money uh her majesty they were working on all of these songs during let it be they were all germinating during this period they show up in the in the in the nagra reels outtakes the all the b-roll of of that if if you've got patience to listen through <laughs> whatever it is 80 cds worth of of beatles outtakes uh these songs all show up so they had and, and they actually talk about and i and i describe in the book there's a there's a a point where they talk about the fact that they've got all these little song snippets that eventually became the the side b uh the long one the huge uh, huge medley so they're talking about and working on songs that become Abbey Road while they're working on Let It Be. So from a from a, a creative standpoint, you could look at 69 as of a piece. Right. You know, they were working on all these tracks. To me, it's logical that what showed up on, on Let It Be were the songs that they could perform live as a band. And the ones, again, that they didn't have confidence in that one way or another, either confidence in it or they heard a bigger arrangement of it than would be facilitated by what started as the ethic of let it be or the, the ethic of get back that they couldn't, you know, they couldn't match that, that they put, they put them aside. You know, that makes sense to me too. Like I can't sing, Oh, darling live. I'm not doing that on the rooftop. Mm-hmm. We'll put that one aside. I don't like Maxwell's silver hammer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to do that on the rooftop. You know, those kinds of, of decisions that you make, but they were certainly working on all of these songs all the way through. But again, uh, uh, Alan, I'm with you that these were independent projects. The first one very well defined is a television special that would have an accompanying, you know, soundtrack album uh, with it. The second one, Abbey Road being initiated because there's no product for 69. We got to get an album out, which is why the Get Back single comes out in the spring and the movie comes out in July or something like that, right? Or of, 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 I forget. You guys would know this better than I do. But again, much, much later. Okay. At the same time, I can't see them performing Let It Be, The Long and Winding Road, and Two of Us on the Apple Rooftop. <laughs> No, but they could report. They could perform them as a four piece. They could perform them as a as a well or a five piece. They could do that. And so you know the the Apple Studio sessions, the work that was recorded the day after, where they did the pickup pieces that required either acoustic guitar or required a grand piano. Those are still songs that we are performing as a as a combo as a four piece. So it fits the ethic. Mm. You know, it fit, it fits the ethic. Uh, that's the way that I looked at it there. To me, there was a profile for the song selected for let it be. And it was, we can do them, you know, we can play them together. It does only takes four pieces to get it done. That, that was really it. And if they heard a bigger vision of it, then it was at least put aside for now. Now, clearly when it came to mixing the songs and finishing the songs, Spectre sure heard a different version, a bigger version oh. of, of a number of those tracks. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, the Beatles in early 69 doing this, I think they had, you know, for lack of a better term, they had a brief for what kinds of songs would make it for the let it be project. Right. And, and those ones fit the bill and some of them didn't. And so they're kind of, moved aside for the you know for the next project Mm -hmm. which came sooner than they thought i think yeah 
Right. Also, I should point out that the Apple rooftop was a last minute decision anyway. So, you know. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, yeah, let's finish the film somehow, and and uh, and all of their their grand schemes of where to of where to perform live, or even to perform in front of a bunch of people. They were not particularly excited about that either. So, um, hmm. yeah, yeah, nineteen sixty nine was a was a really interesting year for the band in all sorts of ways. Oh yeah, have to yeah, have right. to wonder. <laughs> Have to wonder what would have happened if they actually did a live performance. You know what I mean? Like not yeah. not just not the ad hoc rooftop thing, but actually, you know, got a venue in London and got on a real stage and brought people in to hear it. What would have happened with the Beatles? It's you know, it'd be not... fascinating to know what the material would have been. Oh yeah, there's that too. Could yeah, they have possibly that. have gone back and you know even do their more recent stuff from the White Album? You know, you don't know, and that, that would have been perfect. So, yeah. so much of oh, that yeah. is stripped down Beatles. So, yeah, they ran through a little bit of that stuff during the Twickenham section sessions too. So it's, it's conceivable they had that in mind because um, the whole TV idea actually began before let it be uh, or get back as an idea of how they were going to promote the white album. They were talking about playing in the roundhouse and then that didn't work out there. We're talking about playing in Liverpool. I mean, in, in November, December 68, there was a lot of talk about that kind of stuff. And uh, Apple even confirmed it, you know, in interviews uh, at the time. Uh, and then that sort of evolved into the, the get back, let it be project. So yeah, they, they 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 could have promoted the White Album stuff then too. I think that was what how they originally came on the whole TV, uh, the whole uh, uh, live show idea. Yeah. Any final questions, Darren? Yeah, I have one one final question, which is regarding the uh, side two of Abbey Road, the medley. For someone who hasn't picked your book up yet, the new one, Volume Five, do you uh, you walk through how side two was? recorded and put together and how uh, what decisions were made and the way edits were made and what you know how that was all constructed yeah absolutely i walk i walk through it on a song on a song by song basis and, and talk about the assembly of it so all of my uh, all my books go in the order of the first recording session for a song so they don't follow the album you know the album order but they follow the order of the very first session for a song in an era but i definitely talk about when you get into the into the medley the decisions that are made to bring songs to, to bring songs together in a certain way how they had to do that. And, and also the fact that, that a number of these songs were recorded as composites. Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight were recorded at the same time. That isn't two different recordings. That's one recording. Sun King and Mean Mr. Mustard, that's one recording. Polythene Pam and She Came In Through the Bathroom Window, that's one recording. And so uh, I think that might also you know give people a little bit different view on how the how that medley came together. They always knew they had these snippets, and sometimes they were John snippets and Paul snippets. Sometimes there were a couple of John snippets, and and they were, you know, they they figured out how to bring them together pretty quickly. Now, the biggest change in the side two medley was the placement of Her Majesty, and the fact that it was initially sandwiched kind of in the middle of the of the medley, and then got mercilessly cut out with a razor blade after a, a rough mix was was done. And that uh, that merciless razor blade cutting ended up being the the version that we hear on the album. Yeah. With I think the ending the ending chord of Mean Mr. Mustard, uh, the ending crashing chord of Mean Mr. Mustard, uh, is where it starts, and then uh, the fact that they they cut it short <laughs> at right. the end as well. <laughs> and someone had what was it, in the tape engineer uh, had the wherewithal not to throw. No. They no, were told to get rid of it. No, they put it at the end of the reel or something. Yeah, well, he, well, he cut it out. Of, he cut it out of the composite, and then after some, at the end of the uh, of the end, there's some leader tape, and then he just pasted it to the end of the leader tape. Right. And so that's why you get that. That's why you know, uh, and McCartney, you know, you heard it that way, the way that we hear it on the album, where there's a, that whatever it is, 45 seconds that toward the end or something of, of silence and then your majesty appears 
you know, McCartney experienced it that way. And he said, you know, thought that's cool. <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's, let's do that. They invented um, the hidden bonus track. Right. They really, they really did. They really did. Which got seriously abused in the early CD era. I don't know if you guys remember <laughs> yeah. that where you'd see your CD clicking through take or, or track 36, track 38, track 39, yeah. track 40. And all of a sudden, you get a song that you really didn't want to listen to in the first place, but it's there. It's there. <laughs> it really is amazing how they assembled the medleys on site too. And uh, I would have loved to have been there when they decided what songs flowed, you know, in the order, yeah. you know, that they were presented. And uh, just the fact of knowing they never, ever recorded the medley all the way through. They never performed it that way. It was just like two songs at a time together, like you had described it. And that's that's really, that's amazing. I mean, you never give me your money, obviously, it was by itself. But what, what's also interesting was that they had these almost like pieces of songs that they could very easily have said, you know what, I don't know how I'm going to finish. I have this song, uh, Be Mr. Mustard, but it's only a, you know, a brief, throw it away and let's come up with something fully formed fully fully written but no they took all these these pieces and taped them all together and created this incredible yeah no and and that was that was a a conscious act on their behalf they knew they had song fragments they you know again they're they're talking about this during the twickenham sessions that they've got all these song fragments and what do we do with them and you know can we put them together so it wasn't the, the discussion wasn't I've got I've got this song fragment and I've got to finish that song. Mm-hmm. It was we've got these song frag fragments that we like. How do we put them together? That was the discussion. Right. And you know, yeah, the the fact that the Beatles were always doing something just a little bit different, even in that core aspect that now it's not just a song, but it's a song composed of multiple songs. Again, Golden Slumbers carry that weight. Paul Thine Pam, she came through the bathroom window. That's a song composed of two songs. Mm-hmm. And it's yeah, it's just brilliant. The the inventiveness, it never stopped with the Beatles. Absolutely never stopped. Yeah. And and even though John sort of um, you know, in, in, in later days looked down upon that medley, I mean they they actually also did some work to make it work as if it was a flowing composition, even little things like changing um, Mean Mr. Mustard's sister's name from Shirley to Pam so that it would yeah. work with Polly theme Pam, you know, in, in, in the Let It Be sessions, it was Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we, we, we're we all well familiar with, with some of, some of uh, Lennon's revisionism. And uh, <laughs> I have to believe that, you know, if, if, he were still around, there would be a revision of the revision. Um, you know, these things sort of heal themselves over time. But, but on the other hand, he was the guy that said, um, time wounds all heals as well. So, uh, you know, who knows? <laughs> all right. This has been a great conversation. And uh, before we say our goodbyes, why don't we tell the folks listening, uh, give them all our contact information. Jerry, let's start with you. If people want to get in touch with you, or yeah, the, if they want to buy your book, how would they do so? Book. Yeah, you can. You, the books are available from Amazon pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can also uh, get to them through the website, which is, here's a long URL for you, Beatles Recording Reference Manuals, with an S, dot com. And I can be contacted through the website as well. And again, if you you know if you've got these books and you think there's something spotty going on, uh, reach out. I want these to be right. So uh, I, I encourage people to, to give me feedback on on something that they feel like they, they've they got a handle on that I might have missed because, you know, I'm only human. <laughs> Your website's as long as our email address. <laughs> yeah. Darren, how about you? Yeah, I, I was actually, I had needed a few minutes to actually figure out what I was doing wrong or is the website down? I misspelled manual. And when you've got this long name, and then I'm like, what, let's see, two R's, and from I got that right. Oh, it's not <laughs> manual, not manual. There's the problem. But uh, 
if folks want to uh, send me an email, you can write me at WFUV. That's D DeVivo at WFUV dot org or go to Facebook. I have two Facebook pages. Uh, one, uh, oddly enough, is Darren DeVivo. The other is Darren DeVivo at WFUV DJ whatever. If you send me a friend request at the main page, I'll then send you an invitation to uh, join my other page. I'm still trying to figure out why on earth I have to, but uh, there you have it. And if you want to tune me in at WFUV, you can catch me. The radio station is located in New York City, so in the New York City metropolitan area, you can listen to WFUV at 90.7 FM. And for those of you who still uh, dig your HD radios, it's 90.7 FM HD 2 or stream us anywhere on the globe uh, at uh, WFUV.org. We also have an app you can download, and I can be heard Monday through Thursday nights, 10 p.m. to midnight, Saturday afternoons, 1 to 4 p.m. So, I think. Yeah. Okay. Alan, how okay. about you? The easiest way to get me is on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed depending whether you want the original pressing or the remix pressing. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can also contact us, all of us, at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed, which is at things we said fab. And we have, as a group, two Facebook pages. We have things we said today and things we said today, Beatles radio fans. These were set up in the distant past, and uh, uh, Darren has been trying to unify yeah, them. I've, <laughs> you, I've, you been, I've been trying to, to figure out if there is a way, and Facebook I've found to be so user-unfriendly uh, <laughs> that I am trying to figure out a way to take these two Facebook pages and maybe somehow make one big page without losing... So if anyone wants to help me and give me a uh, tip on how to do that, try to get everything consolidated into one, uh, that one of these, one of these uh, eons, I'm threatening to do that. So bear with me. So if you're uh, listening to the show, you know how to find the show, presumably. But yeah. if you want alternatives, since we have two, three of everything, uh, you can hear us on Podbean, you can hear us on YouTube, and you can hear us on iTunes. And one of those versions is posted on our two uh, Facebook pages every week. So there you go. Ken? Okay. As for me, uh, you can email me at everylittlething at att.net. If you'd like to hear my radio show, which is on over 40 radio stations called Every Little Thing, you can go to my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, search for the Every Little Thing page. It lists all the radio stations, the times, links to their websites, and you can stream my show on all those websites. Um, in addition to that, on my website, there's Beatles Trivia every single week, where you can win one of 10 prizes, loads of interviews, including older interviews, with our very own Jerry Havoc, going back to uh, the first book that he put out. I actually interviewed you twice, and now this time. And we'll do it again soon, I'm sure. Um, and uh, I have my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, which airs every other Monday night on Facebook, on our page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. It's mainly about the solo careers of the Beatles. The newest show, uh, we'll deal with our top 15 McCartney songs of the millennium from 2000 through today. We're each going to pick our own favorites and put together our own CD, something like our own Pure McCartney. And uh, so after the show, it stays on our Facebook page. It stays on YouTube. We put it on YouTube, and it's on virtually every single platform out there. And one more thing, I have my own YouTube page now. Ken Michaels Radio, and I'm gradually posting more and more interviews on there. My newest one is with Sam Wiles. He is the host of the solo McCartney uh, podcast called Paul or Nothing. And we do this debate as to whether or not Paul was lost in the 80s, as there has been this narrative that's been being driven for many years now after tug of war. Paul didn't uh, bounce back creatively until Flowers in the Dirt. Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? 
we discussed that in our show. All you got to do is go to Ken Michaels Radio. Please subscribe to that YouTube channel as well as the one for Talk More Talk. And that just about covers everything. So, Jerry, it has been wonderful having you here on the show. Thanks so much, Ken and uh, Darren and Alan. I really uh, had a good time uh, talking about the Beatles with you. Really appreciate it. And as for Jerry Havoc, Darren DeVivo, and Alan Cozen, I'm Ken Michaels thanking all of you for listening. And we'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.